Oracle or to MySQL or to whatever database backend you're using so that you yourself don't have to worry about this ever <laughs> in the future. Um, so, and frankly, you can also then avoid the horrific uh, function, call, function names like MySQL real escape string. Moreover, with libraries like this, CodeIgniter and in turn PDO, all that crazy stuff we did do in 50 with MySQL real escape string, you can forget about because all you have to do is call a prepare method, for instance, and any variables you pass in, CodeIgniter or really PDO will automatically escape for you, which is a huge boon for security because you no longer have to remember yourself. The library does it all for you. So this is a super simple example of PHP code you might use in your own applications. CodeIgniter does this for you, so you don't need to go paste this into Project Zero, but it boils down to this, um, a data source. Uh, uh, data source, which is in this case type MySQL. The database name is jharvard underscore lecture, semicolon host equals this. And 127.0.0.1 is the IP address of any, most any server by default. This is an ugly cryptic looking string, but it's just convention to pass this in and the PDO library will parse it. Um, then we have username password, and then there's this notion. We'll come back to this before long, but for those unfamiliar or less familiar with exceptions, it's a way, again, as we discussed a week or two ago, of passing error messages back that are not in the form of return values, but this gives us, ultimately, what we'll call a database handle. And with that database handle, can we then actually execute some prepared statements as follows? Let me go ahead and just pull up, for now, a simple text editor just to paint a picture of something we'll see before long in more detail, you can do things like this. Statement gets database handle. That's what DBH is often short for. Uh, prepare, let's say select star from table where ID equals question mark. And what you can then do here is statement bind value, and what you can do is one, comma, and then ID. So suppose for the sake of discussion that dollar sign ID <laughs> is the user's ID in question, what you can do with this bind value is bind to it whatever question marks were in your original query, the MySQL real escaped version of that variable. So moreover, there's another reason, because obviously this already feels like a little more work than we used to do with MySQL. What else does this do? Well, the upside of prepared statements for performance is that if you're using a SQL query in a loop, as you might be for Harvard courses, querying course after course after course, or something like that, and you're executing the same query again and again, what the prepare statement, as prepare method does, is it essentially pre-compiles that query. Or rather, it tells MySQL, I'm going to be calling the same exact query, differing only in terms of one or two values, again and again and again, please optimize for that. So that on each subsequent execution of that same query, it's much faster than it would be otherwise. So these are generally known as SQL as prepared statements. And you don't need this cryptic numbering. That's Unfortunately, it's one indexed. It's not <coughs> zero indexed. Um, this is a little cryptic, I think. So more compelling, I think, is to use colon and then something like ID. And then what you can do is this. You can ditch the whole ex binding manually, and you can instead do this. You can execute that statement, passing in for any of these name parameters, something like this. So you pass in an associative array that then maps values to the placeholders that you put in. So if you think back to percent %s in printf, colon whatever is now the new placeholder for this library. So realize this is a better way of doing those kinds of substitutions. All right, so an opportunity now for some design decisions that will hopefully reaffirm how amazing your design is or how much room for improvement there might be. So let me go into, uh, I'll go into the file here. Let's see. Let me go into courses.xml, which is a pretty big file. If you find that it's hanging when you open it up in a browser, it's just because the browser is not very good at opening 10 meg uh, XML files, so open it in text edit or something like that. So here is the very first snippet here. And let's see. Um, just for the sake of discussion, and there's not really right answers, but there are some bad answers, I would say. Um, what, how many tables or what tables should you probably be thinking about creating? You could have one big table. Um, but let me say, based on some design documents we've seen, if any table you ever make in life ever has more than 
50 columns, 100 columns, that's bad. Okay, that's in the bad design category. Um, the reason being that usually suggests that what, you've really, what you should really be doing is factoring whatever data is in those fields out and making them rows instead of columns. The, the principle that should guide you with designing database schemas for, my, for SQL is relatively few columns, but an infinite number potentially of rows, or at least millions or billions of rows. But the width of tables should not be that large. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's flesh out some of these details. So a course has what things that we need to associate with it? We don't need to have all this data in your database necessarily. What's a course? Terms offered, okay, is it fall or spring? And we say in the spec that it suffices just to import the spring courses. So you can even throw that detail away and only import spring courses. Yeah? Okay, so department, and this is an annoying Harvard little thing, right? Like there's the Department of African and Amer African American Studies, and then there's just African and African American Studies. Uh, computer science is under Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences, which technically doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that makes searching sort of annoying. And in fact, those of you who are C uh, concentrators, if you go to the Q Guide, we're still categorized under the entire school instead of the subject area. But so be it. So that's up to you to decide. I would argue from a UI perspective that I am not in the habit of searching for the Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So maybe using what Harvard calls course group is maybe a little more uh, consistent with normal students' mentalities. <laughs> what else do we need to associate with courses? Yeah. Faculty. All right, so faculty. And faculty is an interesting one. So suppose I have a courses table, and a course, the course table at the moment has the course title, let's say. It needs a unique identifier. What's the best candidate? No, catalog number, except, and we did post this on the help board. Anyone come across an interesting corner case yet? Yeah? Yeah, so an applied math class and a religion class somehow both have the same catalog number. So <laughs> welcome to our world um, in playing with this data. So we've emailed the registrar. For now, it suffices to uh, skip, I think, the religion course, which isn't offered this term, but like next fall. But you can handle that however you see fit. For, for cases like that, I mean, is it better to have our own local ID and then it's a really good question. Um, on the one hand, that would be compelling because then it's deterministic and you control the input source. On the other hand, the, the catalog number is supposed to uniquely identify courses. And I would argue that I would shy away, actually, from having your own unique identifier only because if you want to rerun whatever script you're writing to import the data, if you want to re-import the data, you have to somehow in perpetuity remember those mappings that you made. And it just seems like unnecessary complexity to me, at least. Where is the catalog number up there? Uh, catalog number is in the very top. Uh, cat num, where is it? There it is, cat num. So faculty, though, is an interesting one. Does it belong in the courses table? Right, this is where you might, if you did this automatically, might have 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 columns. Right? You probably don't want columns called faculty 1, faculty 2, faculty 3. <laughs> Why? Well, one, you're kind of violating just the intuitive uh, boundaries of like don't have lots of columns. But two, is there really an upper bound? Right? In reality, you're not going to have 1,000 faculty members teaching a course, but where do you draw that line? If it's four faculty members, what if there's a fifth at one point? If it's six, what if there's a seventh? So whenever you have that tension where you have to decide how many of these do I need, it probably means you want to grow vertically, not laterally. So if I wanted to have a separate faculty table, what should go in the faculty table versus the courses table? Yeah. Okay, so the name of the professor. ID. So his or her ID. So that's an attribute in the XML file. The course's catalog number. Uh, so the course's catalog numbers. Okay, so suppose I did this. Not bad, but push back now. Yeah, so what about people who teach multiple courses? Now we run into the employees products issue where we see table, 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 right? We see mail in, mail in, mail in, mail in, or whatever the name is. And so we, can, we should actually factor that out probably. And so what people will typically do is um, they'll have a third table um, and they'll say like course faculty. And often the convention, you can decide on, your, decide on your own style, is to use the name of one table concatenated with the name of the other, usually with underscores, but just be consistent. Don't use all caps. I'm just doing that because I'm using a text editor here. Um, but what would we have under course faculty then? Good, so we would say something like faculty ID and then let's say catnum, 
Um, and even Catnum, you want to be careful because the same, I think, the same course has the same catalog number, even if it's offered both terms, fall and spring. So you want to be careful there that maybe you need a second key there that's maybe term ID. But maybe you can ignore that because we say you only need to support spring, so you could maybe ignore that detail. But this lends itself to an interesting design issue. It turns out that this is probably a candidate for a primary, a primary key, even though it's a little long, it's a string. Um, this is a pretty good candidate for a primary key. Is this a primary key or is this? So not really, but it is a key. It's what we'll call a foreign key. So anytime you have a primary key from one table in another table's fields, you call it a foreign key. But the reason for this extends beyond the semantics. If I go back to uh, PHP MyAdmin, and suppose I have, let me do this real fast. Let me do a courses table that's going to have just two columns, an ID and a name. And this one's going to be varchar 255, enter. Um, I'm going to make the ID field a primary key. Now I'm going to really fast make a faculty table with two columns, just an ID and a name, and 255. And again, I'm going to make this a primary key, enter. So now I'm going to create this. Uh, join table, so to speak, where I'm going to call it course faculty. It's going to have two columns for now. We'll ignore the term issue. And the convention is if you call something ID in one table, in the course table, you should probably call it course ID, and this should be faculty ID, so it's clear to you, the human, what it's mapping to. But let me go ahead and say these are both ints. Let me say that this is actually meant to be indexed. Because I do want to search on it, but it's not a primary key, and it's not necessarily unique if you have multiple faculty teaching the same course. Let me go ahead and click Save there. But now let me do this. In PHP MyAdmin, notice that there's this relation view. If I click on relation view, notice that I can somehow tie this field, course ID, to all of the other tables in my database. And so if I highlight this, <laughs> Let's say course, courses.id. I can tell MySQL that there's this inherent linkage between the courses table and this course faculty table. And moreover, once I select this linkage and then scroll over, notice that I can specify these rules on delete or on update, do the following. You can tell the database to cascade the results or to delete as a result of one table changing. In other words, if I delete Malin from the faculty table, that should, if I set up these triggers, so to speak, should result in all of Malin's courses from the course faculty table automatically being deleted for me. And I no longer have to manually do that with SQL tables. Moreover, this constraint will ensure that just in case I do something stupid, I cannot technologically input an invalid faculty member's ID or an invalid course ID into the course faculty table because I've told MySQL this field must map to this other table's field. So those are the things you should be thinking about. Labs tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. We will see you next time.